A very good afternoon to all the students. I hope you are all in good health. Um, my slides and am I audible? Just quickly write to me in the message box. Okay, fine, fine, fine. So I am audible. Okay, great. So as promised to you yesterday, I told you that we will discuss the exercises that I gave you at the end of my lecture. So before I begin with today's lecture, let me just discuss with you the problems that I gave you yesterday, right? Okay. So in the meantime, the rest of the students will also join. So this was the first exercise given to you. For the function f of z equal to mod z square, you have to mark the correct option. Whether f z is not continuous, whether it is differentiable, or it is continuous and differentiable only at z equal to zero, and f z is continuous as well as differentiable. Okay, so I guess that most of you have solved it. So let me show you the answer. So let's check about the continuity of this function. So we are given that the function f of z is mod z square. So I can write mod z as under root of x squared plus y squared. Since it, it is carrying a square, so this becomes x squared plus y squared. Now to check for continuity, I have to check that the limit value of this function should be equal to the value of the function at the point. Now, since the point is not mentioned, so we assume the general point to be Z0. So when I put Z0 in my function, the value of the function that I will get is X0 squared plus Y0 squared. That means the limit value should be equal to this value. So if I get the limit value equal to this, it will be a continuous function. So let's check the limit of this function. So for the limit, Z is approaching to Z0. So Z means X plus Ita Y and Z naught means X naught plus Ita Y naught. So when you compare the real and the imaginary part, you will get that X approaches to X naught and Y approaches to Y naught and the function is X squared plus Y squared. So as told to you yesterday that you will never put the limits together. We will choose two different paths. So if we choose the first path as we first put x approaches to x naught and then we will substitute y approaches to y naught in the first part. So when I substitute x approaches to x naught, we'll get x naught square plus y square. And then finally, when I approach it with y approaches to y naught, this will get replaced and the term becomes x naught square plus y naught square. That means it is same as the functions value. So let me see that whether I get the same value in the second part also. So in the second part, now I will first approach y approaches to y naught, and then I will follow it with x approaches to x naught. So likewise, you can see these steps, you will get the same value that is x naught squared plus y naught squared. That means the limit of the function exists, and the limit is also equal to the value of the function at the point z naught. And hence, the given function is continuous. So we have continuity of this function. Now let's check about its differentiability. Now for differentiability, you can see that we yesterday did this definition that differentiability is the rate of change of the function with respect to the position, right? So we did the definition and the definition was limit delta z approaches to zero, f of z plus delta z minus f of z divided by delta z. So I have to check whether the limit exists for this particular function, right? So let me evaluate these functions. So f of z is mod z square. Likewise, what will be f of z plus mod z? Sorry, f of z plus delta z. It will be z plus delta z modulus square. So I've written the value here. Then minus f z becomes mod z square divided by delta z. Now, you can convert this. Now you cannot substitute delta z approaches to zero directly because it is becoming a non-determinant form, right? So if you remember yesterday's lecture, we converted the functions in terms of x and y. So what will be z plus delta z? Z is x plus eta y. 
delta z is delta x plus eta delta y. So when you square it up, you will get x plus delta x whole square plus y plus delta y whole square because we are taking modulus. So it will be the real part square plus the imaginary part square minus mod z square was x square plus y square. So there is a negative sign. So both the terms will become negative divided by delta z. So delta z is delta x plus eta delta y. When the function is converted in terms of x and y, so quite obvious, the limit will also get converted in terms of x and y. So the limit was earlier delta z approaches to zero. So delta z approaches to zero means delta x approaches to zero and delta y approaches to zero. And hence, it gives rise to two different paths. We will first substitute delta x approaches to zero followed by delta y approaches to zero. And then we will choose delta y approaches to zero followed by delta x approaches to zero. So I will leave these calculations for you people. So you can simply see that when I put the first part, I get my answer as minus two eta y. And similarly, along the second path, when I do the calculations, the entire calculations are already done. So you can check them and you might have done it yourself also. So you can see that the second answer is giving me the value 2x. That means along the first path, the answer is minus 2 eta y. And along the second path, the limit value is 2x. And we also did the properties of limit yesterday that limit is always unique, right? So the two different paths should give me same limit value, right? So if it is same limit value, that means what does it show that the limit does not exist? And so it is not differentiable, right? But can it be differentiable? Where can it be differentiable? It can be differentiable if I substitute x and y both equal to zero, then what will happen? Two into x will become zero and minus two eta into y, y is zero. So it will also become zero. So if I take my, if you remember that I took the point as z naught, right? So if I'm going to check it at the origin, right that means my z point z naught point is origin then what will happen both the limit values will be same right so only the function will become differentiable only at the origin point not otherwise otherwise you can see that the limit values are different so that means what do you conclude we conclude that the function is continuous but it is not differentiable so let's check the options what were the options provided to us these were the options. So the first option says that the function is not continuous. So it is wrong. The function is continuous. Second option says the function is differentiable. Again, it is wrong. The function is not differentiable. It is only differentiable in one case when z is equal to zero. Look at the third option. The function is continuous and differentiable only at z equal to zero. So this can be the right option. And look at the last option. Fz is continuous as well as differentiable. So this is again wrong because it is continuous, but it is not differentiable. So which one is the correct option? C option is the correct one. That means the function is continuous and it is differentiable only at z equal to c, right? So I think there is no doubts now, right? In the first question, fine. So we move on with the second exercise that I gave you yesterday. The second exercise was, for the function f of z equal to imaginary part of z, the options were given like this. So again, you have to choose between continuity and differentiability. So you have to check in both these points. So let us check what is your function continuous or not. So the function given to us is f of z is imaginary part of z. So what is imaginary part of z? It is y. So I'm writing fz is imaginary part of z, it is equal to y. So for continuity, what do we need to check? We need to check that limit z. Again, the point is not given where I need to check for continuity. So I take a general point as z0. So we will check that whether limit z approaches to z0, f of z is equal to f of z0. What is f of z0? z0 is x0 plus eta y0. So when I will su substitute here, I will only get y naught as my answer. That means the limit value for this function to be continuous, the limit value of this function should be equal to y naught. So let's check the limit. 
So if Z is approaching to Z naught, this will give rise to two paths. X approaches to X naught and Y approaches to Y naught. So we check the first path, X approaches to X naught and then Y approaches to Y naught. So you can clearly see that there is no term of X present. So when you take this path, the limit is not affected, right? And when finally, when you take the limit y approaches to y naught, you will get the limit value as y, right? And in the second part, in the second part, limit y approaches to y naught, x approaches to x naught, y is equal to y naught. So when you take the limit y naught, you will get the answer as y, right? Okay. So what do you conclude from here? That the function, the limit is existing. And it is a continuous function, right? Okay, let's check about differentiability. For differentiability, let's see what happens in differentiability. So in differentiability, we have to check this limit. The limit is limit delta z approaches to 0, f of z plus delta z minus f of z divided by delta z. So let's plug in these values. What is f of z plus delta z according to the question? f of z plus delta z will be imaginary part of z plus delta z. And what will be imaginary part of z plus delta z? It is y plus delta y. Similarly, what is fz? It will be imaginary part of z and hence it is y, right? And then delta z is delta x plus eta delta y. Okay. So again, when I've converted my function in terms of x and y, the limit will also convert in terms of x and y. The path will also be in terms of x and y. So it will give rise to two different paths again. So when you choose the first path, delta x approaches to 0 followed by delta y approaches to 0, you will see that you'll get the limit value as minus eta. And through the second path, when you choose delta y approaches to 0 first and then delta x approaches to 0, you will see that the limit comes out to be 0, right? So you can see that the two different paths are giving me two different values. So the value is not unique. And hence, I can say that the limit does not exist. And hence, it is not differentiable, right? And you can see that there is no variable present here. So they can never be become equal, right? 0 can never be equal to minus i right? So it is not differentiable anywhere, right? So what do we conclude from this question? That your function was continuous, but the function is not differentiable. So which option according to you should be the correct one? The last option, the function is continuous and it is nowhere differentiable, right? Okay. So I think up till here, there is no problem, right? Okay, one of the questions, the student is asking me, how is one upon eta equal to minus eta? Beta, you can always realize your term. Eta is in the denominator. So to make it in the numerator, you can multiply and divide by eta. So when you multiply one with eta, you will get eta and denominator will become eta squared. So eta squared is minus one. So it will become minus i. I hope it is clear. Okay. So with this, we come to an end of the questions that I gave you yesterday. So I begin with my today's presentation and today I will talk about analytic functions and Cauchy-Riemann equations, right? Okay. So let's look at the first topic, Cauchy-Riemann equations. What is it? Uh, we move on with the first section that is analytic functions. Now, what are analytic functions? So, so far, we have studied the concept of limit. We have done continuity and we have done differentiability. Now, what are analytic functions? Let's see the definition. A function fz is said to be analytic in a domain D if fz is defined and differentiable at every point of D. Now, what is a domain D? Domain is just a region, right? So you can easily see that a region always contains infinite points in it, right? So you can see the points inside this domain. So a region always consists of infinite points. So what is the meaning of that the function is analytic inside this domain D? That means 
if i pick any point and i check the differentiability of that function at that point the function should be differentiable so if it is differentiable at all the points of this domain d then we say that the function is said to be analytic in this whole domain d right that means analytic is related with the term differentiability so if the function is differentiable at all the points of the domain then we say that the function is said to be analytic right okay let's see what do you understand by analytic at a point this is analytic in a domain in a region right a function f z is said to be analytic at the point z equal to z not if f z is differentiable in some neighborhood of z not what do you understand by neighborhood of z not let's see suppose i want to see that is my function differentiable at this point so you very well know how to check for differentiability you will see that what is the limit of the what is the change in the function right and then you can check for the concept of limit here and you will get whether the function is differentiable or not now how to check whether it is analytic or not what we will do we will take a neighborhood of that point neighborhood means you take a small radius and mark a small circle around it right the radius can be very very small right so obviously when i enclose that point in a circle it will enclose many other points and we know that a function is differentiable analytic if it is not only differentiable at that point but it is also differentiable at the rest of the points right so analytic at the point z equal to z not what does it mean it means that the function should be analytic at the point also and if i take a small neighborhood along that point the function should be differentiable along all those points within that neighborhood right that means isn't it something more than differentiability differentiability is only at a single point but when i am checking for analyticity i have to check that point also and i have to check the neighboring points also right now you might be thinking that how will i do this in question how many points how do i know that which points are covered in this so don't worry we will come to that topic also that mathematically how will you check that a function is analytic or not right so you should understand what is the meaning of analytic right i am again repeating analytic means that the function is differentiable at the point also and also in its neighborhood clear okay now regular and holomorphic are used as synonyms with the term analytic so sometimes in some books you will find the word analytic sometimes you will also find the words written as regular and holomorphic so regular and holomorphic are same as analytic functions clear okay so we move on with the next topic that how do we check now what are singular points right okay points in the domain of fz where fz is not differentiable they are called the singular points or the singularities of fz now let's go back to the last diagram now suppose this is your domain d and suppose at all these points the function is differentiable but suppose at these points the function is not differentiable it is not necessary that the function will be differentiable everywhere right so let us suppose that at these four points the function is not differentiable so all those points where the function is not differentiable those points are termed as singular points right so the points where the function is not differentiable those points are singular points or they are termed as singularities now what are entire functions a function which is analytic everywhere so if you take a region or a domain and if you check for analyticity that means you check for differentiability at all the points of that region and suppose your function satisfies the differentiability axiom at all the points then you will term that function as an entire function right okay so let's see which functions are always entire polynomial functions and rational functions they are always entire functions right so whenever you take a polynomial function or a rational function they are always entire So these questions they can come in your MCQs, right? 
you might get some other functions also and then they it will ask you that which out of the following are entire functions so automatically it should strike that all the polynomial and rational functions are entire functions right okay now let's see what are an important relationship between all the four things that we have done so far continuity differentiability analyticity and entire functions now look at the circles they are concentric circles and you can also see that in these concentric circles i have named every circle with a different name so you can see that the blue circle has been marked as continuous the pink circle has been marked as differentiable the green circle has been marked as analytic and the orange circle has been marked as entire right what does it mean look at this arrow that means you can move from the innermost circle to the outermost circle what does it mean look up uh, uh, very carefully listen to my statements all entire functions are analytic or analytic functions are differentiable all differentiable functions are continuous am i clear all entire functions they are analytic all analytic functions are differentiable all differentiable functions are continuous i can see that entire circle is contained in analytic that means if a function is entire it will be 100% analytic right then if a function is analytic it will be 100% differentiable can you correlate the definitions how did we do the definition of analyticity we said that a function is analytic if it is differentiable at all the points of the domain right so automatically if a function is analytic it is differentiable right and yesterday in the last slide i showed you that differentiability always implies continuity so if a function is differentiable it will be 100% continuous also right now but if i go the other way around if i go from the outermost circle to the innermost circle that will be not correct that means a continuous function may or may not be differentiable a differentiable function may or may not be analytic an analytic function may or may not be entire right i am again repeating a continuous function may not be differentiable a differentiable function may not be analytic and analytic function may not be entire so you can see that there may there can emerge so many mcq questions from this particular topic they can ask you can an entire function be continuous what should be your answer yes can an analytic function be differentiable yes but if i ask can a continuous function be entire you should at most reply that no the answer is no a continuous function cannot be entire right i think this is clear till here any doubt so far okay so i cannot see any question in the question pane okay fine so i guess there are no doubts till here okay so we move ahead and there is a quick question for you people so let me see are you listening to my lectures carefully and the question is quickly mark the options okay still i can see many students are marking the wrong option so either you have come late or i don't know what where is the problem you didn't understand the topic okay so let me close the question and i can see that 71% of the students have replied the answer as no and that is the correct option right so is every differentiable function analytic no every differentiable function is not analytic right 
So you can just go back to this slide and you can see that every differentiable function is not analytic, this part, right? Okay. Now, so we have finished with the first section. Okay. Uh, if some students are coming, joining the class late, do not expect me to repeat the topics better because you should fun be punctual in the class. So don't expect me that I will start my lecture again. So when you put up a question, please be particular about it, what you are asking. Okay. So we move ahead. We move to the second section that is Cauchy Riemann equations. Now I told you that I, when I was telling you the definition of analytic functions, that a function is analytic at a point. For that, you have to check differentiability at that point as well as in the neighborhood of all those points, right? But is it possible mathematically? How many points will you check? In the neighborhood, there can be many infinite points. So it is not possible to check differentiability at all those points, right? So we cannot go by that definition when we are practicing a question, when we need to check for analytic functions, right? So for that purpose, we have the cauchy riemann equations. So let's see what are the cauchy riemann equations. The necessary and the sufficient conditions for a function to be analytic. What are these conditions? The necessary and sufficient conditions for a function f equal to, yesterday's lecture, if you remember, I told you throughout the chapter, we will follow the same notations. Z will be not, denoted as x plus iota y and f will be denoted as u plus iota v. So this function is said to be analytic. The conditions are, so you can see that the first condition says the four partial derivatives of its real and imaginary parts. That means if I take the real and the imaginary part of this function, I will get u and v. So if I take the partial derivatives, you have done the chapter partial differential equations. So if I take the derivatives, f was a function of x and y. So I will get partial derivative of this real part, real part with respect to x and y. So which derivatives will I get? Del u by del x. And likewise, I will get del u by del y. Similarly, for the imaginary part of the function, that is v, I will get del v by del x and del v by del y. So the first condition says that all these four partial derivatives, they should be continuous, right? And the second condition says that all these four partial derivatives, they should satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations. What are the Cauchy-Riemann equations? The Cauchy-Riemann equations are curl u by curl x is equal to curl v by curl y. Please make a note of it. This is very, very important. Every now and then we are going to use this equation. So the first Cauchy-Riemann equation is curly u by curly x is equal to curly v by curly y. And the second Cauchy-Riemann equation is curly u by curly y is equal to minus curly v by curly x. That means we are relating the first partial derivative with the last one and we are saying that both of them should be equal. This is my first Cauchy-Riemann equation and the second Cauchy-Riemann equation says that curl u by curl y should be equal to minus curl v by curl x, right? So these conditions are necessary and sufficient for a function to be analytic, right? Now we will just focus on what are what is the meaning of necessary and what is the meaning of sufficient right so for now what are those conditions the first condition is that all these four partial derivatives they should be continuous and the second condition says that these four partial derivatives they should satisfy the cauchy riemann equations right so the cauchy riemann equations i'm again repeating curl u by curl x is equal to curl v by curl y and curl u by curl y is equal to minus curl v by curl x, right? Okay, so I think you have noted it down because every now and then we are going to use this equation. So you should recall what are the Cauchy-Riemann equations, right? Okay, we move to the next slide and let us see 
what are the immediate contributions from the necessary and sufficient conditions of analytic functions? The first condition says that if F is analytic in a domain D, then U and V will satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations at all the points of D, right? That means if the function is analytic, if it is given to you, then the real and the imaginary part of this function, the real part is U and the imaginary part is V. So U and V will always satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations. And if I'm talking it about in a domain, all the points of the domain, that means if you check at all the points of the domain D, U and V will always satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations, right? The second conclusion that we get is CR equations are necessary but not the sufficient conditions for a function to be analytic. Now, I was telling you in the last slide that these are the necessary and sufficient conditions. What do you mean by necessary and sufficient condition? That means for the function to be analytic, both these conditions are required, right? But if I just go by the converse of the statement, if I simply say that only the Cauchy Riemann equations are satisfied, then can I say that the function is analytic? No, I cannot say that if my function satisfies only the Cauchy Riemann equations, I cannot say that my function is analytic. It might be analytic, it might not be analytic, right? But if the derivatives, they are continuous also, only then I can say that my function is analytic, right? So that is why we are writing here that the Cauchy Riemann equations are just the necessary conditions. They are not the sufficient conditions. That means if a function only satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations, then it is not necessary that the function will be analytic. It will be analytic only if all the partial derivatives are continuous also, right? So both the points you should keep in mind, right? Okay. Next, Cauchy Riemann equations are sufficient if the partial derivatives are fine. So I think this makes it clear. So Cauchy Riemann equations are just the necessary conditions. So this can be another MCQ question that what are Cauchy Riemann equations? Are they necessary conditions? Are they sufficient conditions? Are they necessary and sufficient both? So which should be your correct option? They are just the necessary conditions. They become sufficient only when this clause is added, when partial derivatives are continuous, right? Okay. Now, another important thing, an immediate conclusion from the Cauchy Riemann equations that we get, that if you want to calculate the derivative of a function, you will be requiring it in the questions. So I'm letting you know what is the formula to calculate the derivative. F dash Z can be calculated as Ux plus Ita Vx. What is Ux and Vx? Ux is del U by del X and Vx is del V by del X. That means partial derivative of u with respect to x and partial derivative of v with respect to x, right? So now you can see that we are only using the derivatives x, but you can see that we can also have derivative with respect to y also. So how can I convert this formula into another formula which contains y? I can use my Cauchy Riemann equations for that purpose. I can also write that f dash z is v y minus ita u y. How? How can I write this? Remember the Cauchy Riemann equations. I told you, make a point of it. Curl u by curl x is equal to curl v by curl y. So this term u x, you can always replace it by v y, right? And similarly, curl v by curl x, you can write it as minus of curl u by curl y. So vx can be substituted as minus uy. So you can get another formula where the partial derivatives of y are involved, right? Likewise, you can write this formula in terms of the variable u or you can write this formula in terms of the function v also. So if you write this formula in terms of u, you can see that the formula becomes f dash z is ux minus ita uy. So I did not change ux, but vx, this was substituted as minus of uy. So this formula is in terms of the function u, the real function u, right? And similarly, I can also write my formula in terms of the function v. 
for v, I did not change vx, but I can change ux. ux can be written as vy. So we have written as vy plus ita vx. So according to the requirement of the problem, we can use any one of these formulas. So it is not necessary that you have to mug up all the four formulas. Just remember the first one. And then with the help of the Cauchy Riemann equations, you can transform the rest of the formulas like I did. Clear? Okay. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Okay. Difference between analytic and entire functions. When I'm saying that a function is analytic at a point, it means I'm only referring to a particular point and its neighborhood. What are entire functions? When the functions are analytic over the entire region. So when I take a domain D, suppose if I check for an analytic function, it might be possible that at some points the function is analytic, but at some points the function is not analytic, right? So in that case, my function will not be analytic everywhere. If my function is analytic everywhere, only then it is called an entire function, right? So I think it is clear now. Okay, any other doubt so far? Okay, so I cannot see any questions coming. Okay, fine, we move ahead now. Uh, let's look at the first example. So this was all the theory done that was required to create the base today. Let's look at the first example. Very simple question. Determine A, B, C, D so that the function f of z equal to, you can just read out that part, it is analytic. So you can see that the function contains some constants, A, B, C, and D. And I need to determine the values of these constants. And it is given that the function is analytic. Right. So just quickly revise, quickly recall what were analytic functions mathematically. Analytic functions were those functions where from f, suppose if I'm talking about the function f, so I will extract the real and the imaginary part that I, I will take up u and v and I will say that all the partial derivatives, the four partial derivatives, they should be continuous and the Cauchy Riemann equation should be satisfied. This is I know about analytic functions. So how to check, how to calculate these constants now? So my first step will be from the given function, I will compare it with u plus ita v and I will calculate what are the values of u and what are the values of v. So I don't think I need to explain this part. So u will come out to be x squared plus axy plus by squared and v will be cx squared plus dxy plus y squared, right? Now, since it is given that the function is analytic, that means it will always satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations. So let me take up the Cauchy Riemann equations. Since the function is analytic, so curl u by curl x will be equal to curl v by curl y, and curl v by curl x will be equal to minus curl u by curl y. So let me take up the first Cauchy Riemann equations. What will be curl u by curl x? Derivative, partial derivative of u with respect to x. You will get 2x plus a into y. This is my left side. And it is equal to curl v by curl y. What is curl v by curl y? Curl v by curl y is partial derivative of v with respect to y, keeping x constant. So this term will become 0. This term will become dx plus y square derivative is 2y. Now you have an equation in terms of x and y. You have equated them. So how will you calculate the values of a and d? Just compare the x and the y terms. When you compare the x terms, what will you get? 2x is equal to dx. So what is the value of d? d becomes equal to 2. Likewise, compare a y with 2y, you will get a is equal to 2. So you got the values of the two constants, d and a. Now let us focus on the second Cauchy Riemann equations. Curl v by curl x is equal to minus curl u by curl y. What is curl v by curl x? Partial derivative of v with respect to x. So I have written it here. So you can check this term. 
curl v by curl x is 2cx plus d into y. So I'm writing the term here and I'm putting a negative sign in front of it. It is, the, you can put the negative sign either in front of this term or this term, right? And curl u by curl y, curl u by curl y is partial derivative of u with respect to y. So it is a into x plus 2 into b y. Likewise, when you compare the x terms and the y terms, what will you get? a is equal to minus 2c and 2b is equal to minus d. These are the two terms that we get from the, this expression. Now you have already calculated the value of a. So a is 2. When I substitute a as 2 here, c becomes minus 1 and d is already evaluated as 2. So when I substitute d here, I will get the value b as minus. So you got all the values of the constants A, B, C, D. And what did we use here in this question? The cauchy riemann equations because it was given that my function is absolute. Right? Any doubts in this question? No proofs are required. So I'm not telling you about the proofs. For proofs, you can refer to the books also. So right now, we have no proofs in your syllabus. Any doubts still here in this question? Okay, so we move ahead. Okay, so the second question says, show that the function f of z equal to e to the power x cos y plus i to sine y is holomorphic and find its derivative. So if you remember, what was holomorphic function? I told you that regular or holomorphic are synonyms for the word analytic. So sometimes it might be asked as analytic. Sometimes it may be given as regular. Sometimes it might be given as holomorphic. So it is one and the same thing. That means there are two parts in this question. In the first part, we have to check whether this function is holomorphic. And in the second part, we have to find its derivative, right? Okay, so let's proceed. Let's see how to calculate. First, we will do the first part. Let's see whether the function is analytic or not. So for to check for analytic functions, we have to check the Cauchy-Riemann equations. If the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied and the derivatives are all continuous, then only my function will become analytic, right? Okay. So for Cauchy-Riemann equations, I have to first of all extract the real and the imaginary parts from the function. So the function is e to the power x cos y plus iota sine y. So you can see that I have just calculated the real and the imaginary part. I've split the terms. And when I compare it with u plus iota v, on comparing both sides, I get that the real part of my function is e to the power x into cos y. And the imaginary part of the question is e to imaginary part of the function is e to the power x into sine y, right? So the first step of my question is done. Now let's check for the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So for holomorphic function, it must satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So you can see that what is curl u by curl x? Curl u by curl x, derivative of u with respect to x, keeping y constant. So we get e raised to power x into cos y was same. It is left as it is. And what is curl v by curl y? Derivative of v with respect to y keeping x constant. So we get e raised to power x and derivative of sine y is cos y. So can you see that the first Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied? Curl u by curl x is equal to curl v by curl y, right? Likewise, we will check for the second Cauchy-Riemann equations. For the second Cauchy-Riemann equations, we will calculate curl u by curl y. What is curl u by curl y? You can check. It is e to the power x into minus of sine y. So we get minus e to the power x into sine y. And what is curl v by curl x? Curl v by curl x is e to the power x into sine y. So can you see that the Cauchy-Riemann equation, the second one is also satisfied? Curl u by curl y is equal to minus curl v by curl x. So this shows that the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied, right? 
Now you can also see that all the four partial derivatives, this one, this one, this one, and this one, they are trigonometric functions. And we know that all the trigonometric functions are always continuous functions, right? So you don't have to check for continuity here. So if you get polynomial functions or trigonometric functions, they're always continuous. So the first condition, the cauchy riemann equations are also satisfied as well as all the four partial derivatives, they are also continuous. And hence I can say that my given function is accurate, right? Now, we go to the second part of the question. The second part of the question says, find its derivative. So let's see how to calculate the derivative. For derivative, just quickly recall, what was the formula for derivative? What was f dash z? So if you recall the value, what was f dash z? f dash z was equal to ux plus eta vx, right? Okay. So I can write it as f dash z is del u by del x. I'm writing the same thing, del u by del x plus eta del v by del x. And you have already calculated these values. What was del u by del x? It was e to the power x into cos y. And what was del v by del x? It was e to the power x into sin. So let me substitute both the values in f dash z. So when I substitute here, I get e to the power x into cos y plus eta e to the power x into sin. Right? Now, how would you solve this part? You can take out e to the power x common. When I take out e to the power x common, I get cos y plus eta sin. And you very well know that what is cos theta plus eta sine theta? It is e to the power eta theta. So I can write cos y plus eta sine y as e to the power eta y. So this term is e to the power x. This term is e to the power eta y. Both are exponential terms. They are in multiplication. So the powers will get added. And hence, I can write it as e to the power x into e to the power eta y, which is e to the power x plus eta y. And what is the standard notation for x plus eta y? It is z. That means we have calculated the value of the derivative of the function f dash z, and that comes out to be e to the power. Right? So any doubts in this question? Any doubts? I cannot find any question. Quickly ask me if you have any doubts, then otherwise I will proceed further. Any doubts in this question? Okay, I'm not getting any other questions. Okay, so I guess that it is clear to all. We move to the next one. Okay, so the next question is example number three. Use Cauchy Riemann equations to show that f of z equal to e to the power z is differentiable, right? Okay, now just focus at this word. We have to check for differentiability, right? And I have to use the Cauchy Riemann equations. So just recall that circle diagram. If you remember that circle diagram, you will say that if a function is analytic, then it will be 100% differentiable, right? So with the help of Cauchy Riemann equations, I can check whether my function is analytic. And if my function becomes analytic, then I can say that my function will be automatically differentiable, right? So you can see that how the things have been intermixed together. Right. So from the definitions, I'm mixing all the terms together so that it becomes clear to you how to apply them in the questions. So how, how am I correlating them? I have to check with the help of Cauchy Riemann equations that is my function differentiable. And automatically that circle diagram should be very clear in your minds that if the function is analytic, then it will be 100% differentiable. So with the help of Cauchy Riemann equations, if I'm able to show that my function is analytic, then it will be automatically differentiable, right? So 
So let's see the solution. So e to the power z. Now to check for Cauchy-Riemann equations, they are in terms of u and v. So the first step is always to extract u and v from the equation, right? So we first of all write e to the power z as e to the power x plus eta y, and it can be written as e to the power x and e to the power eta y, like I explained to you in the last question. It is cos y plus eta sine y. So this will become e to the power x cos y plus eta e raised to power x sine. So when you compare with u plus eta v, you will get the real part of the function is e to the power x cos y, and the imaginary part of the function v is e to the power x sine y, right? So this is the first step of the question. Now let us check the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So let us check first of all. Let us calculate all the partial derivatives. So what is u x? You can quickly do it in your notebooks. What is u x? It will be e to the power x into cos y. What is u y? It will be minus e to the power x into sine y. What is v x? It is e to the power x into sine y. And what is v y? It is e to the power x into cos y. Now, can we see that the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied? Yes, very easily you can see that u x is equal to v y and Vx is equal to minus of uy. So you can see that the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied. Moreover, all the four partial derivatives are also continuous because they are containing the trigonometric terms, right? So if they are continuous and the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied, we can say that the function is analytic and hence e to the power z is differential, right? Okay. Any doubts in this question? Any doubts? Okay, no doubts still here. Fine. Okay. So we move ahead and Example number four, use Cauchy-Riemann equations to show that f of z equal to z conjugate is not differentiable, right? So now, what should be the steps that should be going in your minds? How will I check that it is not differentiable? That means I have to first of all check for Cauchy-Riemann equations. If it is not differentiable, that means it will not be analytic also. When can a function be not analytic? If the Cauchy-Riemann equations are not satisfied. So let us first of all see whether the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied here or not. Let's see. So let's first of all extract the real and the imaginary parts of this function. So f of z is z bar. So if z is x plus eta y, conjugate of z will be x minus eta y. So when I compare it with u plus eta v, the real part of the function is x and the imaginary part of the function is minus y, right? Now let us calculate the partial derivatives. What is curl u by curl x? It is one. What is curl v by curl y? It is minus one. So can I say that curl u by curl x is equal to curl v by curl y? No. So the first Cauchy-Riemann equations are not satisfied. So if the first Cauchy-Riemann equations are not satisfied, I can stop my question here. No need to check for the second one, right? So we can say that the Cauchy-Riemann equations are not satisfied. So it will not be analytic and hence it is not differentiable. Simple as that, right? Okay. So I guess it is clear. If we move on with the next part of the question. Now, we have done CR equations in Cartesian coordinates. We have done it in XY system. Now, sometimes the question is not solvable with the help of the Cartesian system. So we try to convert that system into polar system. It becomes simplified. So if I convert my function in terms of polar system, polar system means R and theta, then I should know what are the Cauchy-Riemann equations in polar coordinates also, right? So in polar coordinates, how do we write z? Now, what is z? Z is, you can write it down in your notebooks. What is z? Z is x plus eta y. Now, when I use polar system, 
what is the replacement for x and y we replaced x as r cos theta and we replace y as r sin theta so when you put the values of x and y as r and theta you will get r cos theta plus eta r sin theta from there you can take out r common you will get cos theta plus eta sin theta and it will become e to the power eta theta so you can always write z as r e to the power eta theta in the polar coordinates right then how to express the real and the imaginary parts of the function of r and theta so f of r e to the power eta theta will become automatically in u and v also wherever you will have x and y you will substitute it as r cos theta and r sin theta so your real and the imaginary parts of the function will also get converted in terms of r and theta so you can express f as u plus eta v like we were doing it in cartesian system so what are the cauchy riemann equations in polar coordinates the first cauchy riemann equations are curl u by curl r is equal to 1 by r curl v by curl theta right and the second cauchy riemann equation is curl v by curl r is equal to minus 1 by r curl u by curl theta so i'm again repeating make a note of it curl u by curl r is equal to 1 by r curl v by curl theta and curl v by curl r is equal to minus 1 by r curl u by curl theta right so these are the cauchy riemann equations in polar coordinates okay now let's look at an example where we are using the polar coordinates so if w is equal to log z determine whether w is analytic okay so first of all i have to extract the real and the imaginary parts and secondly how will you come to know that you have to do this question using polar coordinates or not now suppose if i go on doing this question using cartesian system what will i do i will write log of i will replace that as x plus eta y then what is log x plus eta y do i have any formula to expand log x plus eta y i don't have any formula right so what do we do to expand it we will put this z in terms of r and theta so you can see that w is equal to u plus eta v this is equal to log z so z can be written as r e to the power eta theta and then we have a product rule in log log m into n is always equal to log m plus log n so i can write it as log r plus log e eta theta log and exponential they are inverse functions so they will cancel out and we will get this function only as eta theta so using polar system you can split it into real and imaginary part but if i use cartesian system you have to you can convert it but you have to do some manipulations you again have to substitute x and y in terms of polar system and then you have to use it so we can directly with the help of polar coordinates we can convert it in this form now when you compare it with u plus eta v your u will become log r and v will become theta right now let us check the cauchy riemann equations what is curl u by curl r curl u by curl r will be 1 by r and curl u by curl theta will be equal to 0 and what about curl v by curl r curl v by curl r will be 0 and curl v by curl theta will be equal to 1 so what were the first cauchy riemann equations in polar coordinates curl u by curl r should be equal to 1 by r curl v by curl theta are we getting so what is curl u by curl r it is 1 by r so i can write 1 by r here and this is also equal to 1 by r what is curl v by curl theta this is 1 so the first cauchy riemann equations are satisfied what was the second cauchy riemann equations curl v by curl r should be equal to minus 1 by r curl u by curl theta both are equal to 0 so both will be equal to 0 and hence they are satisfied right so since the cauchy riemann equations are satisfied and all the partial derivatives that you can see they are continuous functions so we will say that the function is analytic right okay any doubt so far oh sorry now next i have a quick question for you So let me see how many of you are attentive in the class. 
So mark the question. Mark the correct option. Okay, let me close the question. And I can see that majority of you have marked the correct option that is all entire functions are analytic. So congratulations to all who have correctly written it. And the ones who have not done it, Please be attentive, right? So good. So many of you have given the correct option. Okay. So how are the derivative? One question has come up that how are the derivatives continuous? I just told you that if you have constant functions or you have rational functions or you have polynomial functions, they're always continuous. So you can see that these are rational functions, so they will be continuous and the rest of the functions are always, they are constant. So they are automatically continuous functions. So these are the properties that we have already done at plus two level when you did continuity in real variables, right? So we are using those concepts only. So here, using those concepts, you can directly say that the function are continuous, right? Okay, so I guess it is clear. Okay, fine. Now, I, I will give you two questions as exercise today. You can just note it down. First exercise, show that the polynomial f of z equal to z square plus z is analytic for all z. This is the first question. Quickly note it down. Show that the polynomial f of z equal to z square plus z is analytic for all z. The first question. I hope you have copied it. And the second question says, first MCQ, for the function fz equal to x upon x squared plus y squared minus eta y upon x squared plus y squared, mark the correct option. Note it out for the function f of z equal to x upon x squared plus y squared minus eta y upon x squared plus y squared, mark the correct option. Okay, so I think you have written the question and anyhow you will get the slides also. You can see it at that time also. And the third MCQ, the third question, not the MCQ, this is the second MCQ. The third question, if fz is xy plus eta y, then mark the correct option. If fz is xy plus eta y, then mark the correct option. So I think you have copied the three questions. So again, before I begin with tomorrow's lecture, I will tell you the answers of these three exercises. Till then, you can just practice them and you can go through the slides again so that you can just revise the lecture once again. Still, if you have any doubts in between, you can ask me right now. We have four minutes still. So if you have any doubts, how is uh, cos y plus eta sine y equal to e to the power eta y? 
I think you need to revise your complex numbers. You have done this there, D Morby's theorem. So you can just revise it. So cos theta plus eta sine theta is e raised to power eta theta. Any other doubts? If anybody else has. Okay, so I cannot find any other questions. Okay, right. So I close the session here. But before I close, there's an important announcement. For the rest of the complex analysis class, the link would be same that you use today to open the webinar. It will be the same. So even if you don't get any reminders, don't worry. Whatever link you were using today, that will be followed for the next few days till your class gets over. I've already sent you the schedule. So according to that schedule, you will follow the same link, right? And all the best for today's FA2. Prepare well and stay safe. Okay. Thank you so much.